independence, Mark Tully begins a series of programs looking at significant and memorable events since 1947. 50 Years of Independence is sponsored by Colgate Total. The man who came to symbolize the Indian nationalist struggle against British rule was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. His technique of non-violent protest became the hallmark of India's independence movement. He made his name in South Africa, where he took up the rights of the Indian community facing racial discrimination. In April 1919, Gandhi launched his first Indian Satyagraha against tough new laws to combat opposition to British rule. The movement grew in intensity after General Dyer ordered the senseless slaughter of hundreds of unarmed protesters in the Jallianwala Bagh in Amritsar. In 1930, the Indian National Congress launched a new movement demanding complete independence. Gandhi captured the imagination of India by his famous March to Dandi, a protest against the salt tax which hit India's poor. In 1931, Gandhi agreed to attend the Round Table Conference in London to seek a solution to India's political problems. But no political solution was found. With the outbreak of the Second World War, Congress provincial governments resigned. The British government had failed to consult them about India's entry into the war. The gulf between the Congress and the Muslim League was deepening. In 1940, the League had demanded a separate homeland for India's Muslims and the scene was set for a bitter and divisive conflict over the terms of independence after the war. Mark Tully continues his look at significant and memorable events since 1947. 50 Years of Independence is sponsored by Colgate Total. During the Second World War, the British government employed tough measures to suppress Indian nationalism in the interest of defeating the Axis powers. But the long war drained Britain's economic resources and its imperial will. When the Labour government was elected in 1945, it decided that the time had come to leave India. Agreeing the terms for the British departure proved very difficult. Sir Stafford Cripps, now on his second vital visit to India, and Lord Patrick Lawrence, after all their efforts, are facing deadlock. While the Congress wanted a united India, Jinnah and his party were convinced that the creation of Pakistan was the only way to safeguard Muslim interests. For a brief moment, it looked as though a solution had been found, a loose federation with autonomous governments in the Muslim-majority areas, and the Congress dominating the rest of India. But the agreement collapsed and communal rioting intensified. Lord Mountbatten was sent to Delhi as Viceroy to break the deadlock between the Muslim League and the Congress. But rioting and killing increased to an alarming degree. To hasten independence, the British, the Sikhs and the Congress accepted the partition plan. They agreed to the creation of a separate Pakistan. The last weeks of British rule were a race against the clock to deal with the administrative consequences of partition. India and Pakistan were about to become independent nations. Is sponsored by Colgate Total. the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. Enthusiastic crowds thronged the streets and welcomed Nehru, now the Prime Minister of an independent nation. Nehru's popularity with the Indian people was one of the reasons his mentor Mahatma Gandhi had chosen him to lead the Congress party during the negotiations which led to independence. 
Lord and Lady Mountbatten, escorted by cavalry, also had their part to play in a ceremony at which he was sworn in as the first Governor General of Free India, a sign of continuing friendship between Britain and India, despite the upheavals of partition. Finally, there was the hoisting of the new flag, a symbol of India's freedom from British rule. Earlier, Karachi had also witnessed the transfer of power from British hands to the new state of Pakistan. Mr. Jinnah arrived in the new capital to prepare for the handover. He and his sister welcomed Lord and Lady Mountbatten, who read the King's message to the Constituent Assembly. Mr. Jinnah then took the oath as the country's first Governor General. Two nations had become free, but partition exacted a very heavy cost in human terms which was to affect relations between them for years to come. The decision to partition India and create Pakistan led to the displacement of millions of people. Hindus and Sikhs left the provinces of the Northwest to make their homes in the new India. Muslims left India to start life again in Pakistan. This mass movement was accompanied by bloodshed and brutality. Violence between Sikhs and Muslims and between Hindus and Muslims resulted in ethnic cleansing. In this appalling process, hundreds of thousands of people were killed on both sides of the border. Delhi became a vast refugee camp, and aid supplies were flown in to cope with their needs. The unprecedented scale of the violence and migration took the new leaders and the British by surprise. Time has only partly healed the wounds which were inflicted in those days. Partition created a legacy of bitterness between India and Pakistan, which was to lead to three wars. For Mahatma Gandhi, the violence that accompanied partition was a period of great disillusionment. In 1948, he started a fast unto death to stop the violence and persuade India and Pakistan to behave like good neighbors. Gandhi said, death would be glorious deliverance rather than I should be a helpless witness to the destruction of India, Hinduism, Sikhism and Islam. weekend Mahatma Gandhi's fast in early 1948 was his protest against the tide of violence that had swept the subcontinent since partition given the promise that the killing would stop he called his fast off but Hindu extremists were infuriated by Gandhi's concern for the Muslims and saw him as an opponent of their new nation. Having survived one attempt on his life a few days earlier, as he arrived for his daily prayer meeting, Gandhi was assassinated by a young Hindu fanatic. His body was carried to the banks of the Jamna for cremation, accompanied by Nehru and the other leaders of the new India. The light has gone out of our lives, and there is darkness everywhere. Our beloved leader is no more. Perhaps I am wrong to say that. Nevertheless, we will not see him again as we have seen him for these many years. Nehru felt a vast sense of loss. For more than 20 years, Gandhi had been his mentor through the most difficult times of the nationalist movement. Gandhi's legacy has been immense. He laid the foundations of a secular India. He taught the world that nonviolent protest could be effective, and his austerity and self-sacrifice still inspire people in almost every country of the world. Fifty years of independence died a year. After. 
With the formation of Pakistan in 1947, Muhammad Ali Jinnah became the father of the nation. Achieving Pakistan in tough negotiations had been a remarkable achievement. Stabilizing it in the chaos and bloodshed of its birth was an even greater challenge. Unfortunately for Pakistan, Jinnah died a year after independence. At Jinnah's side when Pakistan was born was Liaquat Ali Khan, the country's first prime minister. He inherited power on Jinnah's death and sought to reconcile the demands of Islam and democracy in the shaping of Pakistan's constitution. But it was the dispute between Pakistan and India over Kashmir which was to prove the greatest challenge. In 1950, Liaquat signed an agreement with Nehru on the treatment of minorities, but there was no progress on Kashmir. In 1951, Liaquat raised the Kashmir issue among Commonwealth Prime Ministers, but his efforts to win Western support for Pakistan's case were not successful. His assassination in October 1951 removed the only politician with the authority to steer Pakistan into calmer waters. It's still not known who was behind it. After Liaquat's death, democracy faltered and the civil service and the army gradually asserted control, culminating in the military coup of 1958. By 1950, India's Constituent Assembly had done its work and the country emerged as a democratic republic, with the President as head of state and Prime Minister Nehru the holder of real power. Despite resistance from a few, the princely states and their maharajas were absorbed into the new India. The memories of partition and Gandhi's assassination still festered as Nehru worked to transform India into a secular state. The government was to be strictly neutral in religious matters, but was to safeguard the rights of all citizens to practice their own faith. Nehru was the architect of a series of five-year plans designed to make India into a self-sufficient modern economy. This was the key, he thought, to eradicating the poverty which afflicted so many Indians. He also presided over a program of land reform. In developing technology and heavy industry, Nehru saw the Soviet Union as a model. Under Nehru, democracy was firmly established in India. And in three general elections, he led the Congress party to power nationally and from almost all states. Towards the end of his life, however, there were signs that Congress dominance was being challenged. Nehru's major political achievement must be that he left behind a country which was free, democratic, and in large part stable. In 1961, Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh visited India and Pakistan. They were greeted first in Delhi by President Rajendra Prasad and Prime Minister Nehru. The President spoke of past relations and of the influence of Mahatma Gandhi, who, he said, taught us never to acquire an exclusive character. On the third day of the three-week tour, the royal couple visited a community development at Bankrota near Jaipur. Queen Elizabeth was also entertained by the Maharaja of Jaipur, he had been the ruler of one of India's largest princely states. On becoming a republic in 1950, India had ceased to recognize the British monarch as head of state, but wanted to remain within the Commonwealth. To meet the new situation, the Queen had taken a new title, head of the Commonwealth rather than head of state. India's initiative had pointed the way towards a new association of equals. While in Pakistan, the Queen and Duke went on a tour of the famous Malakland Pass and visited the picturesque Principality of Swat. The royal couple returned to Delhi before flying off to Tehran. Later the same year, India's decision to take the Portuguese colony of Goa by force was condemned by Britain as an act of aggression. But Nehru had popular backing for his claim 
that it was the long overdue liberation of the last part of India under colonial rule. Almost alone amongst the Indian nationalists, Jawaharlal Nehru was widely travelled and followed developments in Europe and Asia closely. As foreign minister as well as prime minister, he became the architect of India's new foreign policy. Nehru had two passions, decolonization and disarmament. As leader of one of the first decolonized countries, he became a champion of freedom for other Asian and African nations. At Bandung in Indonesia, he was on the international stage as a world leader, along with China's Prime Minister Zhou Enlai and other Asian leaders. He was pursuing his vision of Asian solidarity and peaceful coexistence. Later, Nehru became a leading figure in the non-aligned movement with Nasa, Tito and Sukarno. But America thought there could be no neutrality in the Cold War. President Eisenhower and other Western leaders strongly criticized India for failing to condemn the Soviet invasion of Hungary. India's decision to take the Portuguese colony of Goa by force was also opposed in the West. Nehru was sensitive to the criticism that he was acting against his own philosophy of non-violence. But he argued that Goa was part of India and that the Portuguese should have negotiated its freedom. Friendship with the Chinese had been the pillar of Nehru's foreign policy, but that was shattered when China invaded India. Fifty years of independence. The Prime Minister of the People's Republic of China arrived in Delhi for talks on border issues that were becoming the cause of friction between the two countries. Anti-Chinese demonstrators turned up at the airport as well. But there were no signs of hostility as the two leaders got down to serious talks. The talks did not resolve the issue. Only two years after the visit, the suspicions about China's intentions proved to be justified. With news of serious Chinese incursions on the western border, crowds were again out in force in Delhi to vent their anger. Nehru accused uh, China of unabashed in. aggression. It is a serious situation. It's obvious that we have to meet this menace. We may have to withdraw here and there. We'll have to meet it. And we are meeting it. We will continue to meet it. With the outbreak of fighting, Indian troops had to contend with harsh, unfamiliar terrain and severe weather conditions. In the northeast, troops retreated and civilians fled across the Brahmaputra River. The town of Tezpur was deserted. Nehru visited Tezpur, where he spoke about the situation on the border. The short border war was an embarrassing defeat for India. And it ended Nehru's vision of Asian solidarity affecting India's foreign policy for years to come. Fifty years of Field Marshal Mohammed Ayub Khan will always be remembered as the man who derailed the political process in Pakistan. As head of the powerful Pakistan army, he imposed martial law in 1958 and established a pattern for periodic military interventions. The Ayub Khan era lasted for more than a decade. There was considerable economic progress and an improvement in relations with the West. Ayub Khan also initiated a process of dialogue with India. He made a brief stopover in Delhi for his first meeting with the Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. Nehru then came to Karachi to sign the historic Indus Water Treaty. He was personally received by Ayub Khan. The signing of the treaty by the two leaders allowing the distribution of river waters for irrigation was a major event. 
The ceremony was attended by senior World Bank officials and delegates from six friendly countries, who also became co-signatories to the treaty. But after Nehru's death, relations deteriorated again, and in 1965, the two countries went to war over Kashmir. Four years after the war, Ayub was ousted from power. His failure to win a decisive victory contributed to his downfall. His system of indirect elections, known as basic democracy, had become unpopular too. Corruption had increased, and the gap between the rich and the poor had widened. Fifty years. When Jawaharlal Nehru, the man who was Prime Minister, led India for 17 years, died, the nation was plunged into grief. An estimated half a million people filed past his coffin as his body lay in state at his official residence in Delhi. Many international leaders came to pay their last respects. Close relatives and friends built up the power around the body before it was set alight by Nehru's grandson. Shortly afterwards, Lal Bahadur Shastri, a lifelong congressman who had previously been Home Minister, was sworn in as Prime Minister. Nehru's daughter Indra Gandhi entered the cabinet for the first time as Minister of Information. A participant in Mahatma Gandhi's non-cooperation movement against British government in India, Shastri, like other nationalists, had served time in prison. He won respect for his simple lifestyle, his fair-mindedness, and his skill as a negotiator. As a follower of Mahatma Gandhi, he wished to see better relations between India and Pakistan. But his short tenure was fraught with difficulty. He inherited serious economic problems and a food crisis. But his biggest challenge was the outbreak of hostilities with Pakistan. Though Shastri was a man of peace, he proved a composed and resolute leader in times of war. The first conflict between India and Pakistan over Kashmir occurred immediately after independence when the future of that princely state was disputed by the two new dominions. With a ceasefire in 1949, an uneasy peace was restored. On the Indian side of the ceasefire line, Sheikh Abdullah, the state's first prime minister, had been imprisoned in 1953 for suspected disloyalty. Eleven years later, he was acquitted of conspiracy and released with Nehru's blessing, Abdullah sought a solution to the dispute with the Pakistanis. However, Nehru then died, and the following year, the two countries were at war again. Hostilities began with a border incident in the low-lying Ran of Kutch on the southern border of Pakistan. The conflict in Kashmir itself broke out in early August, with Pakistan trying to encourage an uprising. This village of Batmalu was set on fire by militants. Pakistan claimed they were Kashmiri freedom fighters, whereas India said Pakistan had sent in infiltrators. Full-scale war then erupted with some of the toughest fighting in the high mountains west of Srinagar, where India consolidated its position. The Pakistanis had been trying to cut off Jammu from India, but it soon became clear that they had miscalculated. By this stage, however, international pressure was forcing both sides to cease fire and a peace agreement was later brokered in Tashkent. India's war with Pakistan over Kashmir ended with a ceasefire brokered by the United Nations. Then India's Prime Minister Shastri and Pakistan's President Ayub Khan travelled to Tashkent. There, with the help of the Soviet Prime Minister Alexei Kosygin, they negotiated an agreement to settle future disputes through peaceful means. Only hours after signing the agreement, Shastri suffered a fatal heart attack. 
leaders of the Congress party chose Indira Gandhi to succeed Shastri. They intended to be a temporary appointment to tide them over the next general election. But India's first woman prime minister turned out to be a tough politician who soon developed a popular following of her own. This, many believe, had been the secret wish of her father, Jawala Nehru. During a whistle-stop tour of Kerala, she made a forceful appeal to voters. It is if we can combine together and really have a united stand, we can win through and hope. Ayub Khan was driven from power by his own army chief, General Yahya Khan. He reimposed martial law. There had been a mass movement in West Pakistan against Ayub, and Zulfika Ali Bhutto had emerged as a new charismatic leader. In East Pakistan, resentment against exploitation by the West had led to protests and strikes. Yahya's decision to call Pakistan's first general election evoked frenzied political activity for months, from the tribal areas bordering Afghanistan to the Delta regions of Bengal. In East Pakistan, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's Awami League campaigned for autonomy. A massive cyclone hit East Pakistan just weeks before the poll, and hundreds of thousands of people died. Many Bengalis thought that the Pakistani government had not acted quickly enough to bring relief which sharpened feeling against West Pakistan. Turnout was high in the election and Sheikh Mujib, riding a populist wave in East Pakistan, won an overall majority in the national parliament. Bhutto wouldn't accept Sheikh Mujib as prime minister. He said he must drop his demand for autonomy first. The army cracked down ruthlessly on Sheikh Mujib and his movement and the war which led to the creation of Bangladesh started. News of the Pakistani army crackdown in Dhaka was picked up by the BBC's monitoring service near London. Troops took over the running of the city and foreign reporters were confined to their hotel. In Chittagong, Bengali nationalists then made a declaration of independence. Pakistan disarmed its own Bengali troops. They became the backbone of a guerrilla army, the Mukti Bahini, which withstood brutal repression by the Pakistan military. One early success for the guerrillas was the fall of the town of Jessore. Much of the country was in chaos and refugees poured into India. The pressure on Indira Gandhi to intervene grew daily. The Indian government had supported the Mukti Bahini from the beginning, but in December 1971, Indian troops were given the go-ahead for military intervention by Indira Gandhi. In some places, Pakistani troops put up fierce resistance, but they couldn't halt the advance of the Indian army. As Indian troops advanced on Dhaka from three different directions, support from the local Bengali population made their task easy. You can take your security Here At you the are. United I'm Nations, going. Zulfika Ali Bhutto was arguing Pakistan's case. He accused world leaders of legalizing aggression. But it was too late to prevent the inevitable. Dhaka was about to fall to the Indian army. Bangladesh still celebrates the 26th of March, the day the nation declared independence from Pakistan. The charismatic leader of the nationalists, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, was arrested. And a nine-month civil war was to play itself out with the founder of Bangladesh languishing in a Pakistani jail. The rebels formed the government in exile. 
Young students and former soldiers of the Pakistan army who'd mutinied launched a guerrilla war. They suffered terrible losses when they took on the might of the Pakistan army. After months of civil war, the Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi ordered in the army. The Indian troops were welcomed by the Bengalis as liberators, but the Pakistanis left a trail of desolation behind them. They deliberately killed many of the intellectuals who supported the nationalist movement. The surrender of the Pakistan army, led by General Niazi, to the Indian commander was a moment of humiliation that most Pakistanis would prefer to forget. Violence followed the nationalists' victory. Many personal scores were settled in the general atmosphere of confusion. If they were lucky, suspected collaborators were taken prisoner. If they were unlucky, they were killed. It was to take the new nation many years to recover from its violent birth. Fifty years. Sheikh Mujiba Rahman's return home was a chance for newly independent Bangladesh to celebrate. The rebel leader was released from jail in Pakistan to find himself in charge of a country devastated by nine months of war. Thousands turned out to welcome him. Sheikh Mujiba Rahman was initially sworn in as president, but soon gave up the office to become prime minister, because that was where the real power lay. His Awami League won a sweeping majority in the country's first elections. But the new government soon lost support as corruption and authoritarianism increased. There were also serious food shortages, leading to thousands of deaths. In August 1975, Sheikh Mujib was assassinated here in his own home in Dhaka. The house is now a museum preserving the memory of almost an entire family gunned down by a group of ambitious army officers. They said theirs was a coup to restore democracy. Earlier, Sheikh Mujiba Rahman had declared Bangladesh a one-party state, curbed the press, and given himself dictatorial powers. That first brutal coup triggered a series of counter-coups and military regimes that set the pattern for the next 15 years. The ideals that inspired the independence movement were betrayed, sometimes by the very people who fought for them. Fifty Years of Independence by Colgate Total. Seven months after the end of the Bangladesh war, Zulfika Ali Bhutto, the Pakistan president, flew to Simla to negotiate a settlement of the problems it had created. Pakistan had not only lost its eastern wing, India was also in possession of a large area in the west, and there were more than 90,000 Pakistani prisoners of war. There was no love lost between the two leaders. At one stage, the negotiations broke down. But late on the last night of the summit, they did reach an agreement. Neither was entirely happy. Bhutto got his territory back, but he had to agree that the issue which most concerned him, Pakistan's claim on Kashmir, was now to be settled bilaterally. Indra Gandhi failed to achieve the final solution that she wanted accepting the division of Kashmir and the ceasefire line as the international border. Bhutto later denied that he had secretly promised he would do so. Bhutto didn't get his prisoners of war back. Indra Gandhi said she had to wait for approval from Bangladesh before releasing them. And Bangladesh insisted Pakistan should recognize the new nation, a bitter pill for Bhutto to swallow. It took another year after Simla for the release of the prisoners of war to start.
50 years of independence. For Bhutto, Pakistan's loss of its eastern wing in the war with India was a blessing in disguise. The humiliating defeat led to General Yahya Khan's fall, and the military brought in Bhutto to replace him. These were difficult times for Pakistan, and most people believed only a charismatic politician like Bhutto could revive nationalism in what was left of the country. Bhutto called the remaining part of the country a new Pakistan and one of his first decisions was to release the Bangladeshi leader, Sheikh Mujiba Rahman. Bhutto tried to give Pakistan a new identity by drawing closer to the countries of the Middle East and the Gulf. He played host to an Islamic summit in Lahore, to which he invited Sheikh Mujiba Rahman. Bhutto no longer wanted to appear to be an enemy of another Muslim country. Bhutto introduced land and labour reforms and nationalised major industries which made him popular with the poor. And under his leadership, Parliament gave the country a new constitution. But Bhutto couldn't tolerate opposition and his growing authoritarianism soon dragged him into controversy. By the time Bhutto called elections in 1977, the army had recovered from the debacle over Bangladesh and was poised to intervene in politics again. When India exploded a nuclear device in the Rajasthan desert in 1974, the government maintained it was for peaceful purposes. The explosion was aimed to give Indira Gandhi's image a boost at home where rising prices, corruption and nepotism had undermined her popularity. But the explosion caused grave alarm in Pakistan, which was still getting over the shock caused by the loss of Bangladesh. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto had been an advocate of nuclear power for Pakistan in the 1960s. Although he placed the emphasis on peaceful nuclear development, there were allegations that he was trying to develop a bomb with Libyan funds. Under Bhutto's successors, Pakistan continued to maintain that its program was for peaceful purposes. But the international community has not been convinced. American suspicions of Pakistan's intentions have prompted it to cut off aid on more than one occasion. There was never a second Indian explosion. India continued to maintain that it was merely retaining the capacity to build a bomb. It rejected Pakistani proposals for a nuclear weapons-free zone in South Asia. In 1996, India stood alone in refusing to sign a new global treaty to ban nuclear test explosions. It said all nuclear powers should agree to eliminate their arsenals first. Fifty years of independence. In 1975, Indira Gandhi suspended democratic rights and declared an emergency. She arrested opposition leaders and censored the press, shocking those who looked upon India as a beacon of democracy in the developing world. Mrs. Gandhi's motive was to protect her own position. A court had found her guilty of electoral malpractices. At first, it seemed she would resign until her appeal had been heard by the Supreme Court. But then her younger son, Sanjay, dissuaded her. Only 28, when the emergency was declared, Sanjay had no post in the governing Congress party and enjoyed no mandate from the people. Yet he was allowed to use the draconian powers his mother had assumed to create a regime of fear. His demolition of slums in Delhi and his family planning campaign made him immensely unpopular. In many areas of northern India, men were forced to undergo sterilization. Mrs. Gandhi tried to keep her hold on the masses by launching a series of populist measures, but she didn't realize how deeply unpopular she'd become. Muzzling all dissent in her own party had cut her off from all reliable information about public opinion. Two years later, 
When Indira Gandhi called a general election, it proved a disaster for both her and the Congress party. She lost in her own constituency, and the party failed to win even a single seat in northern India. Fifty years ago. Stung by international criticism, Indira Gandhi ended the emergency and announced another general election. She and her younger son Sanjay filed nomination papers to contest adjoining seats in Uttar Pradesh. Mrs. Gandhi faced an uphill battle in this important state where millions of poor people had been alienated by the government's sterilization policy. The arbitrary powers Sanjay had wielded and his arrogance had also caused deep resentment. Mrs. Gandhi's defeat in this election was the first time that Congress had lost power since independence, a measure of public resentment against the excesses of the emergency. As a result, at the age of 81, Moraji Desai, the leader of the Janta coalition, finally fulfilled his lifelong ambition and was sworn in as India's fourth prime minister. Moraji Desai had been jailed without trial for 19 months during Mrs. Gandhi's emergency. But his Janta party was an unstable coalition of the opposition to Indira Gandhi. Two years later, dissension within the Janta led to Moraji Desai's resignation. This was a humiliating blow for a man who had regarded himself as Jawaharlal Nehru's natural successor. Moraji Desai was succeeded by Charan Singh, but he was a pawn in Indira Gandhi's hands. And she brought the government down. The year 1977 was another turning point in Pakistan's checkered history. Faced with growing opposition pressure, Bhutto decided to call elections in March. The seven major opposition parties formed an alliance to fight him. During the campaign, Bhutto again proved to be a great crowd puller but opposition rallies were also well attended. Bhutto's People's Party won comfortably, but the results were rejected by the opposition, who accused him of massive vote rigging. When the session of the newly elected National Assembly was called, it was boycotted by the opposition, who demanded new elections. Protest demonstrations took place in the major cities, and the army had to be called out to keep the peace. Eventually, the Pakistan army decided to intervene directly. On July the 5th, Bhutto was deposed by the chief of army staff, General Zia al Haq, and that paved the way for another period of martial law. After seizing power, General Zia promised to hold fresh elections in 90 days, but he didn't keep his promise, and Bhutto was rearrested, this time on a charge of conspiracy to murder a political opponent. Bhutto was found guilty but questions were raised about the fairness of his trial. World leaders appealed for clemency, but Zial Haq hanged Bhutto. It was an act which left the country bitterly divided for years. The communist coup in Afghanistan in 1978 changed the politics of this entire region. The new president, Noor Mohammed Taraki, denied reports that he planned to export Marxism to neighboring countries. But he soon became involved in a battle with the forces of tribal and Islamic conservatism. Moscow decided to intervene and Soviet tanks rolled into Afghanistan to fight the guerrillas. A long and bloody war ensued with the Soviets under constant attack from tribal guerrillas, the Mujahideen, backed by the USA and its allies. For the West, Pakistan had become a frontline state against Soviet expansionism. Pakistan's military ruler, General Zia, who had earlier been shunned for hanging Bhutto, became a highly important ally. The USA provided over $3 billion in aid, turning a blind eye 
to Pakistan's nuclear program. The conflict in Afghanistan drove refugees into Pakistan, creating a refugee problem of major proportions. A large number of Afghan refugees brought their weapons to Pakistan. Weapons also flowed in from the West to arm the anti-Soviet rebels. The Soviet army was bogged down in a war with Afghan Mujahideen it never won. But in Pakistan itself, military rule was prolonged and the return of democracy delayed. Fifth. Although defeated in the general election after the emergency, Indira Gandhi continued to draw crowds. Many of her colleagues in the Congress party deserted her and she formed her own faction, calling it Congress I for India. In 1980, the electorate forgave her, opting for firm government and against factional squabbling. But Mrs. Gandhi's final administration was marked by drift and indecision which eventually forced her to take desperate measures. Sanjay Gandhi, who had been largely responsible for Indira Gandhi's unpopularity during the emergency, remained her chief advisor until he was killed in a flying accident. Indira Gandhi now prevailed on her other son, Rajiv, an airline pilot who had always kept out of politics, to take his brother's place. With Mrs. Gandhi back at power at the center, she failed to re-establish her hold over the state governments. Indira Gandhi tried to rally the Hindu nationalist vote behind her, but her failure to curb the Sikh separatist movement in Punjab alienated Hindu voters in that state until the crisis came to a head with tragic consequences in 1984. The Golden Temple in Amritsar, the Sikh's most sacred shrine, became the headquarters of the Sikh separatist leader, Sant Janel Singh Bindranwale. He turned it into a fortress defended by his fierce young supporters. Bindranwale had been promoted by the Congress party. They wanted to counter the influence of the Sikh religious party, the Akali Dal, which was demanding autonomy for Punjab. But Bindranwale soon turned against the Congress and the Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and launched his own movement for the independence of Punjab. Bindranwale's defiance began to undermine Indira Gandhi's authority. And so on the 5th of June 1984, she ordered the army to launch an assault on the Golden Temple. Bindranwale was killed in the army action, but it left the temple complex bloodstained and badly damaged. Many innocent people were killed or injured. That day had been a Sikh festival and many pilgrims had come to celebrate it at the Golden Temple. Sikhs in India and throughout the world were horrified. Indra Gandhi paid a visit to the Golden Temple in an attempt to assuage their hurt. But it went too deep. For years, Punjab remained in the grip of separatist violence. But Mrs. Gandhi never lived to see the turmoil the state was to go through. Just four months later, she was dead, gunned down by her two Sikh bodyguards. Indra Gandhi was walking through the garden of her home in Delhi when two of her bodyguards, both Sikh, shot her dead. They were taking revenge for the Indian army's attack on the Golden Temple in Amritsar, the Sikh's most sacred shrine. That evening in Delhi and other parts of North India, an orgy of violence broke out against Sikhs. Gangs, often led by Congress party workers, roamed the streets, killing, burning and looting. The riots left at least 3,000 people dead and another deep scar on relations between the Congress party and the Sikhs. 
world's leaders gathered for the funeral of the woman who'd been a formidable defender of India's interests internationally. In India itself, she had always drawn crowds wherever she went, whether in or out of power. But the streets of Delhi were almost empty as Indra Gandhi's body, laid on a gun carriage, made its way to the cremation ground. Fear created by the riots had kept her admirers away from her last journey. The funeral pyre was lit by her son Rajiv, now Prime Minister. He appeared remarkably composed, but later it was clear that he was bitterly angry. As the flames rose, Rajiv's wife Sonia and his two children joined him. Little did they know that seven years later, they would be performing the same ceremony for Rajiv. At midnight on the 2nd of December 1984, the world's worst industrial accident occurred in the city of Bhopal. A deadly gas leaked from the pesticide plant owned by a subsidiary of the American multinational Union Carbide. Those living in the slums opposite the Union Carbide plant were worst affected by the gas. People woke in the darkness, unable to breathe, and many died within minutes. Whole families were wiped out. Many of those who survived lost their sight, and others suffered permanent damage to their lungs. As day broke, thousands of victims were taken to the city's main hospital, where doctors struggled to give them some relief. Many succumbed to their injuries. Thousands also fled the city, seeing the scale of the disaster. The Prime Minister, Rajiv Gandhi, came to Bhopal to express his sympathy for the victims. The initial shock turned to anger against Union Carbide and its chairman, Warren Anderson. He was asked why safety measures hadn't prevented the disaster, and why such a poisonous, powerful insecticide was being produced in a densely populated area. Over a thousand people died on the first night. The number of dead has risen to nearly 5,000. It was the assassination of his mother that made Rajiv Gandhi Prime Minister of India. He had worked as an airline pilot and with his wife Sonia and their two children had kept out of public life. But when his younger brother Sanjay died in a flying accident, Rajiv agreed to become his mother's political heir. After her death, he led the Congress party to its greatest victory ever. With his interest in computers and technology, Indians saw him as a modernizer. In Punjab, he tried to make peace with the Sikhs after the trauma of the Blue Star operation. But sending the army to intervene in the Sri Lankan ethnic crisis proved disastrous. Sri Lankan anger was expressed by a sailor in the Guard of Honor when Rajiv visited Colombo. Indians disapproved of the expense and the failure of the operation. The Gandhi magic began to fade as Rajiv got caught up in allegations of corruption over the purchase of guns made by the Swedish company Bofors. Rajiv Gandhi loved to travel and cut an impressive figure on the world stage. But he seemed to lose touch with ordinary people. With his former defense minister VP Singh campaigning against him, he lost the elections in 1989. The opposition had exploited his failure to prove his innocence in the Bofors case. For many pious Muslims, General Ziaul Haq was a military ruler sincerely trying to turn Pakistan into an Islamic state. 
In the eyes of the West, he was a defender of the free world against Soviet expansionism in Afghanistan. But for those who wanted political rights in their own country, General Zia was a military dictator. He justified himself by his Islamic reforms, setting up Islamic courts, enforcing Islamic punishments, and bringing in new Islamic taxes. He intimidated his opponents with public floggings. The hijacking of a Pakistani airliner gave General Zia the excuse to crack the whip even more ferociously. Two years later, the combined opposition launched an agitation against military rule. The uprising was eventually crushed by the army, but it forced General Zia to hold elections in 1985. These were boycotted by his opponents. General Zia lifted martial law only after the new assembly had amended the constitution to give him the powers he demanded. In 1988, he used those powers to dismiss the government and the assembly and to announce fresh elections. But General Zia didn't live to see the results of those elections. In a mysterious air crash, he and some of his top military commanders perished. When Benazir Bhutto returned to Pakistan from exile, hundreds of thousands came out to receive her. Remarkable proof of the staying power of the Bhutto dynasty. But it wasn't until after the death of General Zia that she got a chance to prove her following at the polls. The 1988 general election turned out to be a contest between pro-democracy forces led by Benazir and an alliance of parties which had emerged during the military regime led by Nawaz Sharif a Punjabi industrialist. Benazir Bhutto fought an impressive election campaign attracting large crowds, but her opponents also demonstrated that they had a following. Benazir's People's Party was returned as the largest single party in parliament, but she didn't have an absolute majority. She did, however, become the first woman Muslim prime minister in the world, but she had to compromise with the army to stay in power. Benazir tried to implement some of her election promises, but got bogged down in confrontation with her opponents. The opposition and the press accused Benazir's husband, Asif Zadari, of corruption. Only two years after coming to office, the president dismissed her, accusing her government of corruption and inefficiency. Benazir learned the hard way that it was the president, not the prime minister, who wielded ultimate power in Pakistan. Kashmir's natural beauty used to attract tourists from all over the world. Although since independence, India and Pakistan have disputed its boundaries. But 10 years ago, the situation in Kashmir became more tense. An election in Indian administered Kashmir brought Farooq Abdullah to power. He was the son of the legendary leader Sheikh Abdullah, known as the Lion of Kashmir. Many young Muslims, disgusted by what they regarded as rigged elections, joined militant groups. Violence escalated, and in 1990, there were massive anti-Indian demonstrations. The central government clamped down, imposing direct rule. Indian security forces became involved in a war with Islamic guerrillas. About 20,000 people died. The Indian government described the guerrillas as terrorists, but Pakistan claimed that they were freedom fighters. India accused Pakistan of arming and training militants. Pakistan denied this, but lost no opportunity to support the militants' cause and to embarrass India at the diplomatic level. After six years of deadlock, the Indian government held another election in Indian-administered Kashmir. Farooq Abdullah was re-elected, but the militants and politicians opposed to India did not accept the results.
50 years. By the end of Rajiv Gandhi's term in office, his former cabinet colleague V.P. Singh, now heading the Janta Party, was emerging as a credible alternative candidate for the prime ministership. In the general election, Rajiv Gandhi failed to win an absolute majority, and V.P. Singh was sworn in as prime minister at the head of a fragile minority government. It lasted less than a year. He introduced quotas for disadvantaged castes in government jobs. Many upper caste Hindus feared the implementation of these proposals would be the end of their hopes for jobs. Thousands of young men and women held protest rallies. Several burnt themselves to death. VP Singh refused to back down. But opposition to the quotas was mounting in Parliament too. And when the Hindu nationalist BJP party withdrew its support for the government, BP Singh resigned. But his successors did not withdraw the quotas. They feared they would lose the vast vote of the underprivileged castes. The 1990 election was a turning point in Pakistan's history. A wealthy industrialist, Mian Nawaz Sharif, was elected prime minister in a country which had traditionally been dominated by feudal landlords. Businessmen welcomed his liberal economic policies and Pakistan started to attract foreign investment. But there was growing lawlessness in Karachi and other parts of Sindh province. The army targeted the MQM with its strong following among migrants from India. Hundreds of people were arrested and large caches of arms recovered. The action was denounced by the MQM's leader Altaf Hussain staying in London. To add to Nawaz Sharif's problems, the opposition leader Benazir Bhutto launched a movement against him in the capital Islamabad and nearby Rawalpindi. In 1993, the president intervened again. Accusing Nawaz Sharif of corruption, he dismissed his government. The Supreme Court overturned that decision, but the deadlock between the president and prime minister continued eventually the army chief persuaded both to resign. After just 18 months out of office, Rajiv Gandhi was campaigning again in a general election. His opponents had been unable to form a stable government. On the last day of the campaign, Rajiv was assassinated at a rally in South India by a woman suicide bomber. Tamil Tigers denied they were responsible, but it was widely assumed that they had taken revenge on Rajiv Gandhi. He'd sent the Indian army to Sri Lanka to fight them. The assassination gave Congress a sympathy vote in the second round of polling. They were able to form a government under the veteran Narasimha Rao, one of the most loyal supporters of the Nehru Gandhi dynasty, which had dominated India since independence. Although often seen in public with her husband, Rajiv's wife Sonia had always stood aloof from politics. After his assassination, she rejected the proposal that she should become leader of the Congress party.
But throughout the Prime Ministership of Rajiv's successor Narasimha Rao, Sonia Gandhi remained a power behind the scenes, wielding considerable influence whenever she chose to. When Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated by a suicide bomber, his Congress party chose P.V. Narasimha Rao as their leader and Prime Minister. Rao had earlier announced his resignation from politics. He'd enjoyed a long career as a cabinet minister, but had no personal following in the party. The more powerful candidates for the leadership hoped he would be just a stopgap. In fact, he remained Prime Minister for a full five-year term. He was admired for his political shrewdness, but criticised for being indecisive. By failing to prevent the destruction of the mosque in Ayodhya, Rao lost the Congress party its traditional Muslim vote. But he did start an economic revolution. Finding India bankrupt when he came to power, he accepted the IMF and World Bank's terms for a loan. They demanded that India opened its highly protected economy to international competition and investment. Finance Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh did make an impressive start on dismantling the bureaucratic controls protecting the economy. He succeeded in attracting much needed foreign investment too. But the measures didn't go as far as international businessmen wanted and India lagged behind the other Asian giant China in attracting foreign investment. In 1996, weakened by his failure to sell the economic revolution to the voters, and suffering from the loss of the Muslim vote because of the destruction of the mosque in Ayodhya, Marasi Mara was routed in a general election. On the 6th of December 1992, a vast crowd of supporters of the Hindu nationalist BJP attacked a mosque in Ayodhya and pulled it down stone by stone. This extraordinary event in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh happened in broad daylight and in full view of the police who made no attempt to stop it. The media were attacked when they tried to record what was happening. The demolition of the mosque was the culmination of a campaign launched by the BJP and its affiliated organizations. They claimed the mosque had replaced an earlier Hindu temple, marking the birthplace of the god Ram. The BJP demanded that the mosque be destroyed and a temple built on its site. Events in Ayodhya unleashed an outbreak of violence, but the BJP leader Lal Krishna Advani denied that his party was responsible. Riots broke out in different parts of the country. A curfew was imposed in some areas and security forces patrolled the streets. The worst affected was Bombay, the commercial capital of India. Three months later, a series of bomb explosions in that city killed over 300 people. The demolition of the mosque and the riots left many Muslims wondering what their future in India was. Although peace was restored quite quickly, Congress never regained the support of the Muslims. Elections in 1993 gave Pakistan a straight choice between two former Prime Ministers, Benazir Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif. Both had failed to last a full term of office. It was a neck-and-neck -neck race, with Benazir Bhutto's People's Party emerging the stronger in Parliament. One of her first tasks was to try to deal with the problem of relations with India. Officials from both countries met in January 1994, but the talks broke down over the issue of Kashmir. They were to be the last talks for three years. Relations with the opposition led by Nawaz Sharif started badly and got worse. He tried in vain to remove Benazir from power by calling strikes and the two sides refused to cooperate in Parliament, even on issues on which they agreed. Karachi and Benazir's home province of Sindh continued to cause trouble too. In November 1994, she decided to pull the army out of Karachi. 
But in July 1995, Benazir started a security operation against the MQM, the party she blamed for the law and order problem. Hundreds of its activists were shot dead by security forces or in prison. At the same time, her relationship with the president, Farooq Lagari, was collapsing. Pakistan was heading for another crisis. Before independence, social reformers in India tried to tackle the more divisive aspects of caste. Mahatma Gandhi campaigned tirelessly to end untouchability and to bring the outcasts back into the Hindu fold. He renamed the untouchables Harijans or Children of God. But it was the introduction of adult suffrage after independence which quickened the pace of social change. In the early years, the Congress under Jawaharlal Nehru built its political dominance in North India on an alliance between the higher castes, the Brahmins and Rajputs, and the Harijans and the Muslims. But by the late 60s, repeated elections had created greater awareness of the value of the vote. The lower castes began to organize themselves. The wealthy farming castes were the first to assert a separate political identity. Chaudhry Charan Singh, the Jat leader, broke away from the Congress, formed his own party, and became the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh in 1967. Other backward castes followed, and soon the Congress and its opponents were fighting each other for their support. In many states, governments began reserving seats in educational institutions and the civil service for these castes, provoking a backlash among the more privileged. VP Singh's Janta Party, which took power in Delhi in 1989, built its support on the backward castes. His lieutenants, Malayam Singh Yadav and Lalu Prasad Yadav, became important political forces in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. <laughs> The funeral of N.T. Ramara, the film star who used his popularity at the box office to build a political career. He came to epitomize the rise of regional parties in southern India. N.T. Ramara was swept to power in his home state of Andhra Pradesh on a wave of anger against Mrs. Gandhi's autocratic treatment of her chief ministers. He'd only just formed the Telugu Desam Party. Although NTR was unpopular while in office, he was re-elected in 1994. But he fell victim to a family feud and was ousted by his son-in-law. In the neighboring state of Tamil Nadu, another film star, M.G. Ramachandran, won the hearts of women film goers by playing the role of the good man. That popularity brought him to the chief ministership of Tamil Nadu and to lead a regional party. Regionalism is so strong in Tamil Nadu that the National Party of the Congress has not been able to gain power since 1967. When MGR died, he was succeeded by his close assistant and former co-star, Jaya Lalita. And when she was defeated in an election, another regional party came to power. 